I am standing in front of a modern bridge in Oslo, capital of Norway, and this bridge is called the Jerusalem Bridge. And why is that? Why Jerusalem in the middle of Oslo? There are several places in Norway called Jerusalem, and the bridge has its name from a small farm which was located there in the 19th century. And we find the name Jerusalem, but also other biblical names, Jericho, Bethlehem and so forth, many places in Norway and in Scandinavia. The existence of such place names is part of the background of what we have tried to investigate in our three books, namely what we have called the Jerusalem Code in Scandinavia. Jerusalem is the holy city to three world religions. To Christianity, it is the place where it all began. But Christ himself died and resurrected, according to the Christian tradition. With the introduction of Christianity in Scandinavia in the Middle Ages, Jerusalem became the center of the religious world, also to people living here in the north. To the Christians, Jerusalem was both a city in the east and a city of heaven. It was the destination of humankind and the goal of history. It was a concept linked both to time and space. And what we have traced in our project is how this concept was understood and used through thousand years of Christian history in Scandinavia. Together with scholars from various disciplines, we have looked for Jerusalem references in architecture, liturgy, royal rituals, law, history writing, uh, literature and visual arts. Uh, from three periods, the medieval period, the early modern period and the modern era uh, of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Let us show you some of the examples of how the Jerusalem Code have been working in Scandinavia. One example is this circular church in the middle of Tønsberg, a town at the eastern coast of Norway. It was built in the 12th century by premonstratensian monks and it is the largest of its kind in Scandinavia. Circular churches built in this period often quote or mimic the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem by sharing the form of the rotunda above Christ's empty grave. The connection to Jerusalem was religious, of course, but also political. And exactly here, in 1190, a group of Danish and Norwegian magnates were gathered to plan an expedition to Jerusalem. And they set out from Tønsberg in 1191 to take part in the Third Crusade. However, they failed because many of their ships went down and the few of them who eventually reached Jerusalem came there only to see that Saladin had defeated the Crusaders and Jerusalem was once again on Muslim hands. Scandinavia became Christian at a time in history when being a Christian meant to defend the faith with armed force and fight the infidels. We see that Crusade Jerusalem plays a significant role in the shaping of Christian cultures in medieval Scandinavia. We are now in a parish church uh, in the countryside outside Oslo, dating from the 12th century. And here, Jerusalem is evoked in the frescoes that we see above the chancel arch. The medieval understanding was that every single church represented Jerusalem. During the Middle Ages, numerous Jerusalem relics arrived in Scandinavia, like pieces of the Holy Cross, uh, thorns from the crown of thorns or drops of Christ's blood, and also pebbles and soil from the ground on which he walked. These ways of representing Jerusalem did not continue in Scandinavia after the Lutheran Reformation in the beginning of the 16th century. So what happened? How did Martin Luther change the Jerusalem code in Scandinavia?
to Luther and his followers in Scandinavia, Jerusalem was no longer a holy city. Holiness was not something that could be represented and transferred physically anymore, as in the medieval period. So a bit from Golgotha, a bit of stone from Golgotha, or a drop of blood from Christ didn't matter anything anymore. What mattered was what was transferred by the word and by the pulpit. So the true Jerusalem was where the word of God was clearly preached and where the true worship was maintained. And this was such a place. We are now standing beneath the walls of Akershus Castle, the medieval royal castle of Christiania, which we now call Oslo. And here the cathedral was built in 1639. And as we can read in a description from that time, the cathedral was just like the Temple of Jerusalem, built beneath the walls of the Castle of Zion. And unlike the churches from before the Reformation, this church was like the Temple of Jerusalem, not because of sacred relics or sacred liturgy, but because the citizens of Christiana gathered here to listen to the true word of God as understood by Martin Luther. And the true Jerusalem was transferred by the preaching, not only to Luther City Wittenberg, but also to Copenhagen and Christiania. As a Lutheran ideal state, the Kingdom of Denmark-Norway became a beacon of Europe. The Danish-Norwegian kings ruled from Copenhagen, just like the kings of the old Israel ruling the chosen people of God. Their discipline, ordered by penalties and prayer days, was modelled on the chosen people of God, Israel. And when the catastrophe occurred, as in the city fire in Copenhagen in 1728, or here in Christiania, when a lightning suddenly struck the tower of the cathedral only 40 years after it was built, the anger of God had struck his people in a deserved punishment for their lack of faith, just as God in his anger and through his tool the Romans had struck the Jews and the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. And this history about the destruction of Jerusalem became the most important example for the chosen people of God in the early modern period. It was a frightening pedagogical example. If God could punish his own people and extinguish the city, how could you ever imagine he would spare us, the Christians, if we lived in sin? And this is the recurring question asked again and again then by the Lutheran theologians in the centuries after the Reformation. And the main source to the fall of Jerusalem is the history as it was told by Josephus. And the transmission of this history is remarkable. In the Danish Norwegian material we find the history used and told again and again in psalm books, prayer books and sermon collections. In the early modern period, Jerusalem in the east eventually became a distant city, partly because the Ottomans had invaded the city in 1517 and Jerusalem became more or less unreachable to the Christian pilgrims. After the fire of Copenhagen in 1728, for example, when the catastrophe was a fact, the preachers say they don't need the example of Jerusalem anymore. Jerusalem was a city far away and scarcely visible. Instead, they had their own Jerusalem within their own hearts and within their own ruined city of Copenhagen. When we arrive at the period of pietism in the 18th century, the use of Jerusalem changes again. Here we stand in front of a small prayer house exhibited at the Folk Museum in Oslo. It stands as a token for the lay folks movement and pietism that was so important in Scandinavia in the 19th century. It started in the late 18th and profoundly changed the landscape of Scandinavian Christianity. The awakenings entailed that religion was individualized. Uh, each individual believer could read the Bible on her own or write down her Lebensleif, her life story, as in the case of the Moravian women in Christiansfeld. The Norwegian lay preacher Hans Nielsen Hauge used Jerusalem metaphors to encourage his followers to action. Anna Spafford, a Norwegian-born lady in Chicago, she encouraged her whole congregation to move to Jerusalem because he thought the coming of Christ was near. 
She was later joined by farmers from north in northern Sweden, from north in Dalarna, who sold everything they owned to join her in the American colony in, in Jerusalem. Their life stories were immortalized by Selma Lagerlöf's famous novel Jerusalem, for which she won the Nobel Prize in Literature. If the prayer houses uh, were a symbol of the social transformation that the Scandinavian countries underwent in the 19th century, let the royal palace in Oslo stand for nation building and international politics. In an effort to build the identity of the new nation, uh, Norwegian turns to history and to the great medieval kings, one of whom was Sigurd the Crusader. And when a new edition of Snorre Sturlason's uh, sagas of the king were planned in the late 19th century. Uh, a Norwegian artist, he got uh, the task to make the illustrations. That was Gerard Munte. And Munte, he chose as one of the important motives King Sigurd riding up to Jerusalem together with King Baldwin. And later that motive was turned into a tapestry woven by Frida Hansen. And this national tapestry, as it was called, was later exhibited at the World Exhibit in Paris in 1900. The 19th century indeed is a century of nationalisms, and each and every European nation wanted a representation in Jerusalem. Protestants who travelled to the Holy Land uh, were not interested in rituals. What they wanted to do was to discover and know the Holy Land in a scientific manner. Since the biblical exegetes and the biblical truth was challenged by new findings in philology and geology, which actually challenged the truth of the Bible, Bible scholars, they needed new evidence to prove the truth of the Bible. So hence, they went to the Holy Land and, and they started important scientific programs. And it was actually the Americans and the British who were the protagonists or the main actors in this uh, work, but Protestants from Scandinavia also played a part. For instance, Wolrat Fucht, the principal of the Cathedral School in Oslo, uh, who wrote an important treatise named The Holy Land. It was a big encyclopedic work where he assembles all the knowledge that uh, Europeans and American scholars had gathered about the Holy Land, and it was published in Norwegian. Uh, Folrat Fucht, he also wrote a Bible history for Norwegian school children. And it actually formed generations of Norwegian school children and their imaginary uh, knowledge about the Holy Land. And in their classrooms, they also very often had maps. They had the Bible history uh, displayed on the wall of their classroom. And this was the way that generations of Norwegian internalized the landscape of Bible land. In the 19th century, from palace to prayer house, from king to lay person, Jerusalem remained important. <laughs> The examples we have shown you mainly come from Oslo and the district around, and this is due to the pandemic. The three books, however, that are the result of our research contain examples of Jerusalem reception from all over Scandinavia throughout a millennium. The Holy City, the Chosen People and the Promised Land are concepts fundamental to the Christian tradition and these concepts have influenced Scandinavian societies in ways more variegated, more fundamental and more multiple than we usually think.